கே வி திருமலேஷ் ஆன் த டெத் ஆஃப் வர்ஜின் பை ஹர்மன் ப்ரா இட்ஸ் இம்பாசிபிள் ஃபார் மீ டு திங்க் ஆஃப் த பெஸ்ட் புக் ஐவ் எவர் ரெட் ஐ லீவ் இன் த வேர்ல்ட் ஆஃப் புக்ஸ் ப்ளோரல் அண்ட் தே இன் டேர்ன் இன் ஹேபிட் மீ ஆல் தோ அண்ட் அக்னாஸ்டிக் இன் பிரின்சிபிள் ஐ ஹாவ் அ ஹெரிட்டேஜ் அண்ட் பாலிதீசம் ஐ ஆம் மல்டி லிங்குவல் மல்டி கல்ச்சுரல் அண்ட் ஹாப்பி தேட் வே in a singular world i'll be as unhappy as that rupees artist in kafka short story first sorrow you know that in that story the rupees artist realizes one day that he has been given only one rupees and then longs for another that is the first sorrow i've been made by many great books from many languages so it will be unfair and untrue on my part to select any one of them as the best for the purpose of this talk today i've selected one of the best books that i've ever read and that is a 1940s novel called the death of virgin by the famous emigrant writer hermann bro translated into english by jean star and termeyer from original german with great care and devotion both the original and the translation were published simultaneously in 1945 a date that coincides almost prophetically with the end of the second world war started in his native country austria continued in exile in england and finished in the united states it's needless to say that bro composed this masterpiece under most trying conditions the genesis of this novel is said to be a few elegies that bro had written in anticipation of his own death when he had been detained in prison soon after the annexation of austria by the nazis he was however released from prison with the intervention of james joyce and allowed to emigrate to england brock later moved to the usa and settled in princeton writing and helping people to escape from nazi germany the elegies he wrote in prison were later incorporated into the death of virgil i do not remember exactly when i first came across this great novel but i do remember that it was in the library of central institute of english and foreign languages hyderabad india some years ago what attracted me to the novel at first sight was the title carrying the name of the famous poet virgil i had with me for some years my own copy of john dryden's english translation of virgil's epic poem aeneid and sometimes i used to dip into it note its majestic opening lines arms and the man i sing who forced by fate and haughty juno's unrelenting hate expelled and exiled left the trojan shore these lines are unforgettable and so too are the episodes concerning dido her suicide and the ending of the poem the vengeful killing of turnus by aeneas the words arms and the man have inspired many writers in different ways including milton and bernard shaw so i thought i'd see how the novel the death of virgil reads and checked it out of the library and started reading it at once the experience was stunning it took a long time for me to finish reading it though mainly for two reasons if i find the writing interesting my pace of reading becomes slow for i start ruminating over it and secondly and more importantly in this context the style was forbiddingly difficult when you read a book for yourself and find it great you don't ask yourself why you find it great but on an occasion such as this the reader is expected to say something about the quality of the work so if i ask myself why i like the death of virgil how far can i take this why question to begin with let me say that i find it very different from most other novels that i have read what do i mean by different let us take the conceptualization of the novel itself which i think is brilliant and extraordinary we may remember that virgil around 70 bc to 19 bc died in his middle age just 19 years before the birth of jesus christ legend has it that virgil was ill and died before actually finishing his ambitious epic aeneid and that he had expressed a desire to destroy the work why was he dissatisfied with it 
nobody knows the real reason the story is apocryphal but is the basis of the present novel brock takes up the last day of virgil as the temporal scope of his fiction so just like james joyce's ulysses the story of the death of virgil too happens within a span of 24 hours when the novel opens we see virgil in a ship coming close to brundisium it is one of a fleet of ships returning to italy from athens after a campaign and in the very front ship is caesar octavianus augustus 63 bc to 14 ad emperor and friend of virgil virgil is very ill and has to be carried on a stretcher by his side is a chest that contains the manuscript sheets of aeneid yet to be finished the entire novel from beginning to end descriptions thoughts memories fears and premonitions are mostly narrated from the point of view of virgil caesar augustus whom virgil affectionately calls octavian comes to visit the poet there is a great conversation between the emperor and the poet wherein all kinds of things are discussed especially the matter pertaining to the epic poem itself why does virgil want to destroy his own lifetime work we don't get a clear answer to this question but if we may guess from his monologues and dialogues he seems to think that what he has written has no relevance for the future the new era that he can see emerging on the horizon the interview with the king is friendly but is not without tension for it is partly philosophical partly personal but also partly political for example here is an excerpt the organization into a whole would never have taken place had not the individual soul found its immediate connection to the supernatural only the work intended for direct service to supernatural serves all earthbound humanity as well these are extremely dangerous and novel ideas virgil they derogatory to the state through them the state will perfect itself into a kingdom from a state of citizens it will become a kingdom of men you are shattering the structure of the state you shatter it to a shapeless uniformity you split up its ordinances you destroy the firm texture of people page 377 throughout the aeneid virgil has identified caesar augustus with aeneas the legendary hero of rome in the exploits of octavius he has seen the glory of the founding of rome by romulus and remus and the present resurgence of the roman nation thus the poem and the nation have become one knowing this the poem as nation octavius will not let it be destroyed but claims it on behalf of the roman citizens for preservation it is as though the poet has lost the right to his own creation to a superior power namely the power of the nation and nationalism enshrined in the corpus of caesar it now becomes more and more clear that the dying virgil wants to discard the poem for the very reasons for which octavius wants to preserve it namely the identification of race and nation who was the one hand and royal glory and military victory on the other at the very beginning of the novel virgil is disturbed by the mass frenzy of people waiting to receive the king and his royal entourage including the poet himself he thinks that in all his poetry he did nothing to address the violence of the mob and in a side glance at modern history we know that brock is implying here the mass frenzy of all sorts whipped up by the considerations of race religion nationality and such other fundamentalist ideologies in an argument with lucius virgil says beauty cannot leave without approval truth locks itself off from applause page 247 virgil asks two favors of the king firstly the freeing of his slave boy and secondly show of mercy to the vanquished be lenient to the conquered and temper your arrogance to that end page 396 both these points to the future abolition of slavery and abandonment of a tooth for a tooth policy that is vengeance we may remember how the aeneid ends turnus has fallen on the ground and aeneas doesn't know if he should kill him or not 
and then he notices how turnus had not only killed his friend pallas but also appropriated his trophy in an aroused rage aeneas then sends his sword down into turnus's chest vogel would like octavian to represent the changing of times no slavery no vengeance this however raises a question does the novel endorse vergil's view of the aeneid does it approve of his desire that the epic be burnt since it purportedly belongs to the old world we feel that the world would have been poorer without the aeneid but when vergil himself did not like it for the reasons specified and we tend to honor those reasons without argument what makes us want it i think that the novel takes a larger historical view of the past according which a change of time doesn't mean destruction of the past but redeeming its truth the death of virgil is very dense in its descriptions the very opening paragraphs are an example of it wherein is described the homecoming of the roman fleet to the port of brindisium the emerging landscape is described from the point of view of virgil on the ship and description runs into several lengthy paragraphs each with periodic sentences here is a passage o oh, unbridled became the desire to stretch the hand toward those still so distant shores to reach into the darkness of the shrubbery to feel the earthborn leaf between his fingers to hold it tightly there forevermore the wish quivered in his hands quivered in his fingers with uncontrollable desire toward the leafy branches toward the flexible leaf stems toward the sharp soft leaf edges toward the firm living leaf flesh yearningly he felt it when he closed his eyes and it was almost a sensual desire sensually simple and grasping like his masculine raw bone peasant's fist sensually savoring and sensitive like the slender wrested nervousness of this same hand and so on and on page 18 and then comes a page length paragraph on this strange pulsation of the hand one can't read such a book continuously for a long time one can only read a few pages of it at a time although there is a story to follow you very soon discover that it is not the story that keeps you going there is some other sheer narrative power that sweeps over the reader something beyond the story it becomes orchestra and also painting across an immensely large canvas the novel has been divided into four parts water the arrival fire the descent earth the expectation and air the homecoming this gives a quartet like structure to the novel describing one Virgil's arrival in Italy. Two, his dark thoughts about hell, his ruminations about the world, especially his conversation with Caesar. And three, his vision of the future. And finally, his withdrawal into nothing, that is, his death. But the reading experience takes the whole narrative as an integrated whole, an undulating ocean, oceanic. since the novel has been conceived in the style one can read it over and over again from wherever one wants of course it is exhausting as it sucks you in but is never boring in fact the novel seems to demand repeated reading since there is some deep thought in each passage each passage is part of a whole but is also autonomous in a sense the book is comparable to such magnum opuses as pounds cantos Joyce's Ulysses, Proust's Remembrance of Things Past, Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain, and Tolstoy's War and Peace. There is always some new discovery to be made in such returns, some new flash of insight to be gained. The very difficulty is enticing. And I need not dwell upon the novel's criticism of the evils of war, violence, racism, religious intolerance, and the concept of the nation state. having been written during war time its relevance is highly contemporaneous what is more its appeal is also perennial although brock uses hindsight to speak through virgil it does not diminish the importance of the novel
talk given at the International Writers Workshop, Iowa, 2005. All page references are to The Death of Virgil, translation by Jean Starr Untermeyer, New York, Grosset and Dunlap, 1965.